Barb Kirkmeyer running for um, Congressional District 8. First, kind of just tell us a little bit about you know, yourself and you know, how you're introducing yourself to uh, the people that could potentially be voting for you in November. Sure, and thank you for the interview today. Thank you for the question. Um, so I'm Barbara Kirkmeyer, I'm running for Congressional District 8, as you just said. And I grew up in Colorado. I'm a fourth generation Coloradoan, grew up on a dairy farm, come from pr some pretty modest background. Uh, and uh, throughout my life, I've been a county commissioner for 20 years. Served, I've served in the state senate for the last couple of years. Also served as a small businesswoman. And I owned a dairy farm in Weld County. And so, um, you know, you've got that, that county commissioner experience, mm -hmm. you've got uh, some state senate experience. Um, has that kind of given you some of that right name recognition that you maybe didn't have as a, as a first-time candidate? You know, are people a little bit more familiar with you now, or are you still kind of going through that introducing yourself and getting people to know you? Sure. I, I think people are pretty familiar with who I am. Obviously, in some of the areas um, in Adams County, I'm not as well known as I am up in Weld County and even Larimer County. But I think what actually has lended towards me being able to know a lot of folks is I have a strong agricultural background and fought very hard for oil and gas, the oil and gas industry and those oil and gas jobs in this area. And this district sits right on top of the Wattenberg field, which is the fifth most producing oil and gas field in the nation. So I have that experience in, in working for those jobs and the people who work in that industry. Then it also sits right on top of probably about a million to a million and a half uh, acres of prime irrigated farmland. So again, my background in agriculture, I, I, you know, basically I'll be the only, if I get elected, I'll be one of the dairy farmers or former dairy farmers in Congress. But even right now, um, if I were to be elected and be honored to serve as their congresswoman, I'd be the only congressperson in this state who has a background in agriculture. And again, number one in agriculture, number one in energy production. So tell me a little bit more about, um, obviously this is a new congressional district, this 8th congressional district, mm -hmm. um, you know, the potential that you see for it and the role that you think that it could play and you could play as a member of Congress representing, you know, this new district and as a freshman lawmaker. I, I think it's greatly important. Um, again, this, this district is strong in agriculture, is strong in energy production. Uh, so having that voice for those Coloradoans, those people who work in that industry, having that voice in Washington, D.C., I think would be huge. I don't know that we necessarily have it right now, um, so I really would like to be back there and be able to say this is what's important. Again, I grew up on a dairy farm, and, you know, again, from modest backgrounds, and uh, we were poor when I was a kid. And so as we were growing up, we were all expected to work on the farm. And my parents, uh, when we turned nine, we were expected to join 4-H, which is a great leadership program. But they didn't give us a heifer calf. They went out and selected a calf out of the herd and then told us we owed them $100 for it. So I learned right away about debt. I learned about paying off that debt. I learned about hard work and just what was important. My parents taught us that if you work hard, opportunity comes your way. And so when people ask me, why are you running for office? I tell them because I have six grandkids. And that may sound a little bit corny to folks, but I have six grandkids who are not getting the same opportunity to grow up in the America I grew up in. The America that valued and rewarded hard work, that gave everyone, everyone a fair shot at success and an opportunity to prosper. So I think with my background, I think being able to represent this district, this strong district in, again, in agriculture and oil and gas production, and you know, just those strong working families, which I came from one, which I am one, I, I think really will lend to uh, me being able to be a great voice for this district, for Colorado, back at our nation's capital. And so you have um, a brand new congressional district and you have two female opponents running against um, one another. I mean, how uh, big of a deal is, is something like this to know that no matter who wins, you know, there's going to be a female in Congress, there's going to be a female representing this district, you know, and what would you bring you know, as, a, as a female voice, you know, to, to, to Congress? Uh, well, quite frankly, I've run as a female <laughs> against other females several times, you know, as county commissioner. Um, even as a state senator, I had a female opponent, a Democrat female opponent, when I ran for state senator two years ago. So I, I guess I, I'm not sure that that really makes that big a difference. Uh, again, in this, in this district, and when I run for office, I think people are looking at what are our experiences. So as a county commissioner, I was able to lead my county to zero debt, reduce taxes, and reduce regulations. I think that's important to point out when you're talking about 
a nation that has 9.1 percent inflation, a state where we're number one in inflation at, what is it, 15.5 percent right now, where people are hurting. People are understanding that, you know, it's costing them a lot more money to live here in Colorado and in the United States. In fact, when you really think about it, our inflation being at 15.5 percent, what that means to Colorado families, those working families, is now that if they were what they were paying two years ago, now they're paying about eleven thousand dollars more annually for things like their groceries, for their gas, for their housing, and for their utility, their their energy costs. Eleven thousand dollars. And when you you sit back and you look at it, you think, wow, you know, the average salary in the state is around fifty seven, sixty thousand. And that's not even your take home pay, that's your average gross salary. So when we're taking eleven thousand dollars away, just poof from inflation, from poor policies that my opponent and Joe Biden have been passing for the last couple of years. And your, your money just goes poof and it goes away. It's $11,000 that they don't have to spend on gas, on groceries, on shelter, on their energy bills. And now people are living paycheck to paycheck and they're greatly concerned about what's going on. So I think my experience in being able to lower the debt, when we have a country that is $30 trillion in debt, that's $90,000 for every man, woman, and child. You need somebody who has the experience that knows how to balance a budget, cut the debt, and get this, get this nation back on track. And that's who I am. And we'll get much more into the economy here in just a bit. One more on kind of just the makeup of your district. Yes. Um, you know, the thing that um, has really kind of stood out is the Hispanic uh, population, mm -hmm. you know. So how do you plan, you know, as a candidate and as a potential congressperson to uh, represent that district and, 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 you know, and all of the diverse voices and, you know, do it in a way that's better than your opponent, you know, who has built herself as, as um, being, you know, the voice for the Hispanic community? I think I'm going to treat them the same way I treat everyone else in the district. I've run for county commissioner, I've run for state senate. The Hispanic community is a rich part of our community. They're part of the fabric of our community. In fact, Spanish and Mexicans help settle a large portion of this. So their concerns, when I'm at the door talking to folks, their concerns, whether it's Hispanic or non-Hispanic, are still the same. It's about inflation. It's about how much does it cost me to fill up my gas tank. And in January when I started walking, it was like $75 to fill up you know, their, their Suburban or their truck or whatever they're driving around. In June, it was $115 to fill up their gas tank. Now we're back down to about $75 to $80 to fill it up. It's still high. That's still making a difference for them. When I'm talking to them at their door, they're telling me about the crime in their community and how concerned they are about that, that they don't feel it's safe for their kids regardless of who it is. They don't feel safe that it's their kids. Can't even walk home from school. When I ask people all the time, like, you know, what's going on in your neighborhood? How are things, you know, as far as the crime goes? They start talking about how they know everybody, or at least somebody in their community, has either had their car stolen or their catal catalytic converter stolen. And again, they just don't feel safe. We had a 40-year high inflation rate. We're at a 25-year high crime rate in this state. Thanks again to my opponent coddling criminals and basically reducing felonies to misdemeanors, allowing cashless bonding out, personal recognizance, you know, going after law enforcement and, and defunding the police. That's what's going on. That's what I'm hearing about. So again, you know, whether I'm talking to folks who are Hispanic or non-Hispanic, I mean, I, they're part of the fabric of our community. I've lived in this community for generations, for close to 40 years now, here in, in Weld County. And, you know, these people are my friends, they're my family, they're my neighbors, they're people I go to church with, people that I've been involved in the community with. When we were building the rec center in Fort Lupton, these are people that I'm, I'm working with to make the community better. Let's go ahead and um, start getting into some of the, the topics. Um, let's start with the first one, um, abortion. Um, so you have said that, or your opponent, I'm sorry, rather, has said that um, you support a nationwide ban on abortions with no exceptions. Um, and it is, I wanted to know, is that the case? And you know, where do you kind of draw the line in terms of weeks or exceptions? Anytime your opponent is describing and trying to define who you are, you can usually pretty much guarantee that they're wrong. So I have basically, I have come out and stated that I am in support of a 15-week ban. So after 15 weeks, that abortion would be banned. So that's what I've supported. Um, you know, I am, I've always stated that I was pro-life, and I am. 
But again, when people have asked me, when I asked, was asked a few weeks ago, when I was asked a month or two ago, I told them that I would support you know, a 15-week ban. Because for me, it's about saving, whether you save a few babies' lives or no babies' lives, which is totally different than my opponent's position, which she has come out and said, and she's voted on, which is she's willing to allow abortion all the way up to the point of when the baby is due, and then she expects that the public should pay for it. I think that's an outrageous position, and I think she should be questioned on her own position on abortion. Are there any exceptions when it comes to um, <coughs> after that 15 weeks, you know, if it came to, you know, an, an unfortunate choice between, you know, the mother and, and the baby? Absolutely. So there could potentially be exceptions after 15 weeks? Yes. Um, the other thing is that, you know, we've seen some of these bills kind of start coming up in, in, in Congress, one in particular, where they said, you know, a nationwide potential abortion ban. Is that something that you could potentially get behind as a member of Congress representing the 8th District? I haven't seen any bills that are presented at that point, at this point that are doing that. So I can't tell you if I would get behind those bills or not until I've had the opportunity to read them. But I have stated very clearly that I would support a, a ban on abortion after 15 weeks. Is this something that um, should be a federal control? Do you think the state should control? I mean, how do you kind of see the role of government in, in something like this, um, you know, within... Sure. Those parameters. And I basically think I've answered that question, again, because I've said that I would support a ban on abortion after 15 weeks. And again, when I'm at the door, this is not the question I'm getting. This is not the topic that people are talking about. They're talking about the economy. They're talking about the inflation. They're talking about the high cost of living. They're talking about the crime in their community. They're talking about being energy independent again instead of being energy dependent. They're worried about their jobs. They're worried about their small business, whether or not it's going to be able to stay home and make it through the recession that we're in. Because regardless what the federal government says, people at the door believe we're in a recession. And they're greatly concerned about those issues. They're worried that they don't get, and they're, they're ticked off, that they don't get the opportunity to choose what their child's education opportunity should be. Those are the things that we're talking about at the door. Has there been, do you think, more emphasis this year because of what we saw with the Dobbs decision and some of the subsequent legislation that has come out. And then concurrently, we've also seen multiple polls from different Latino groups here in Colorado that have shown a high interest in the abortion issue. So is it fair to focus on the abortion issue because of how much it, it's changing and how much is taking place uh, You know, this year in particular? I think in this state that it hasn't really changed that much at all we passed a law that basically we already had in place. So again, when I'm out talking to folks, um, maybe during the primary I had a handful of people who wanted to talk about the abortion issue. After the primary, I haven't had anyone at the door want to talk to me about abortion. They want to talk to me about the economy, the cost of living, the public safety issues that are going on, and their children's education where they think they should get to direct their children's education and not government. So that's what's going on out there when I'm out talking to folks. Um, let's switch topics. And um, since you keep bringing it up, let's talk a little bit about inflation and government sure. spending. You've talked on the campaign trail about government spending, the need to cut down. Um, you know, how do you see the government uh, being as big as it is cutting down? Are there specific things that you would try to go in there you know, within your first term and, and really target? First of all, I haven't just talked about the government needs to cut its spending. Um, it's important that it does cut its spending. But my experience and my track record has proven <clears throat> that I have cut government spending. Um, again, I led my county to zero debt. We have no, absolutely no debt. And then we started lowering taxes and going after regulations that were overburdensome and duplicative on people and on business and industry. So I think at the federal government, there's a lot there. And you have to go through and really take and look at a strategic plan and look at areas. But I think we're going to have to look at certain entitlement programs and make sure that we are funding those folks that greatly need the programs versus maybe some of the folks who don't. There's a lot of areas, I think, in um, <clears throat> some of our human services programs that we need to look at. Uh, back in the late 90s, you know, through a Democrat president and a Republican Congress and Senate, we were able to really look at the welfare programs and make some changes there that help people get back to work and become self-sustaining. Those are areas that I'm interested in and looking at. What, how much control do you think that you know, members of, of Congress and um, Congress in general have over inflation? What would you like to see specifically done when it comes to 
um, inflation as, as you've kind of brought up those rates multiple times? Sure. Um, at the national level, we need, first of all, we need to balance our budget. We don't have a balanced budget. We're in debt to the tune of $30 trillion. We need to start figuring out how to cut the debt. We also need to, um, we, don't, we don't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. We need to stop spending. We need to stop paying people not to work. Those are areas that we can work on as um, Congress, in Congress, with our Senate and hopefully with the President. Do you think the spending problem is a, just because we have um, Democratic <coughs> control right now, is it a uniquely Democratic thing? Um, is there Republican blame to, to, to share there, you know, when it comes to kind of <coughs> how we're spending and what we're spending and how we can fix this? Sure. I think in the last two years we've been controlled solely by Democrats. The, the Democrats are in control in Congress, they're controlling the U.S. Senate, and obviously we have a Democrat president. So I can think it can be laid solely at their feet because two years ago the price of gas was what about two bucks a gallon now it's uh, anywhere from 360 to four dollars a gallon the price of milk is two dollars more than it was everything has gone up so I can th I think that yes the inflation that we have right now can be laid solely at the feet at the, at the poor policies that Democrats have been passing because they're in charge same thing goes in this state I'm in the minority as a state senator my opponent representative Carveo She's in the majority. We have a Democrat House, we have a Democrat Senate, we have a Democrat Governor. So that 15.5% inflation rate, yes, I think it's all on them and their poor policies. So when it comes to, you know, you're, you're talking about the inflation, but when it comes to the, the government spending was what I was asking about, do you think that the government spending is a uniquely Democratic problem or, you know, is there, when we're talking about cutting back? Sure, I, again, I think very specifically in the last two years at the national level, being controlled completely by Democrats, that the government spending is on them. They get to put anything through they want. I think it's the same way here in the state. And again, my opponent, Representative Carveo, who's in the House, when we're overspending, when we're increasing government by over 4,000 FTE, so 4,000 more employees in government, so when we increase the bureaucracy, we increase spending, we more than double our budget, then yes, I think that's on them because they're the ones who are in charge and they're the ones who can put anything through that they wish to put through. Sure. So there is no balance, no balance at all. So President Trump added nearly $7.8 to the national <coughs> debt during his time in office. It's nearly twice as much as what Americans owe on student loans, on cars, on every major debt except for mortgages. Um, <coughs> if Republicans you know, were to win one chamber, both chambers, this midterm election, um, and started suggesting more spending, you know, are you committed to not only, you know, taking on some of the Democratic debt, as you've pointed out, that we've kind of seen some of the Democratic spending policies, but also, you know, are you willing to take on your Republican um, cohorts to make sure that spending is going the way that you think it should be going in order to kind of help ease that burden on families? Absolutely. So, and, and let me just be clear also on this. So the... Um, Republicans in Congress have made a pledge, a commitment to America, that talks about how do we get to cutting the deficit? How do we balance our budget? We're putting a plan in place to do those things. Cut the spending, balance the budget, take on the deficit, no more deficit spending, really start working through our budget and have a strategic approach to it. So Republicans in Congress have made a commitment <clears throat> to a commitment to America to do that. And <clears throat> I'm supporting that commitment to America. It's about economic freedom. It's about making sure, again, that we balance our budget, that we cut spending, that we quit putting such huge debt, not another trillion here or another trillion there. I mean, we have basically a $7.5 billion budget in the nation that we've never balanced, or I shouldn't say never, but in the, you know, in the past few years, we have not balanced the budget. And I think uh, President Biden and the Democrats have added close to, what, $5 trillion just in the last couple of years to our, our nation's debt. I think those are things that we can vote against. But Republicans in Congress, under Leader McCarthy, have come out with a commitment to America. And all of them have committed to that, have all pledged to that commitment. All the Republican candidates for Congress have pledged to that commitment as well, myself included. So that means we're going to work work really hard. We're going to start working the very first day to cut the budget, to cut that deficit, to get spending under control. And I know from my experience, it doesn't happen overnight, 
but it has to start someplace, and we're going to start on day one. Let's go ahead and transition again and talk now about um, border control. Um, yeah. What specifically would you like to see done as a, um, a candidate, uh, as a member of Congress with the U.S.-Mexico border? How can we fix what's happening right now? We need to secure our border. Um, we need to finish building the wall. We need, you know, people who want to come into our country need to come through the front door and quit going through the backyard. So we just flat out, we need to secure our border. It's uh, incredible the amount of drugs that are coming across that border. Uh, these open border policies of Joe Biden's and Nancy Pelosi have basically made every state an, a border state. And we need to secure our border. What does securing our border look like? Is that an actual border wall? Is that uh, more, you know, of the technology kind of thing? I mean, how does that look to you? It's, it's all of that. I mean, it's about building the rest of the wall. There is great technology that's involved, you know, in working to secure a border. In fact, I was just down at the border about six weeks ago and was able to visit and look at where the wall ends and then also talk to the people who are doing the different technologies with the drones and, and the cameras and that type of thing as well. Our border uh, patrol agents, they're under a lot of great stress. They feel like this administration has abandoned them. In fact, they were talking about how in this sector, that where we were at, which was El Paso, Texas area, and, you know, and we went into Arizona and New Mexico because it's all very close right in there. And they were talking about how a lot of their Border Patrol agents, their friends, are all going to retire because there's just so much stress. And they can't get people to fill the jobs now. So again, it's, it's about everything. It's about ensuring that our Border Patrol agents know that we have their backs, that we're going to fund them appropriately, that we're going to make sure that they have the tools and the resources that they need to be able to do their job. It's about, again, securing that border, building the wall, using whatever technology we need, but encouraging and telling people that you need to come through the front door. You know, if you're coming into America, you're coming to the United States, come in through the front door. We need to be able to vet the people that are coming across that border. We need to make sure and uh, be able to ensure that we are stopping the flow of fentanyl across our southern border into, again, not just into Texas. These open border policies have made every state a border state. Fentanyl is coming across, coming all the way up here into Colorado and impacting us greatly here. I mean, I think we're number two in the nation with regard to fentanyl overdose. We don't want to be number one. Quite frankly, we don't want to be number two. What do you mean by open border? Um, I've heard you use that in a couple of instances on the campaign trail. It's open border. People can just walk right across. They walk across through the river, and they walk right across, and the next thing they, you know, they're into our country. They haven't been vetted. We have no idea how many people actually are coming across. We don't know what kind of drugs they're bringing across. The border is open. We essentially have no border because it is so open. There have been about two million apprehensions this year, so um, is that a fair characterization to say that it's, that it's open? They have caught nearly two million. They can't even begin to tell you how many that they haven't caught. It's the same with the drugs. They have, they told us when we were down there, just through August, they had seized 11,000 pounds of pure fentanyl. That's what they were able to get. They know bunches coming across that they aren't getting. Five million pills, five million pills laced with fentanyl is what they were able to seize again. But they know they're not getting all of it. So how much did they miss? That's what's coming across. And that's what I mean by open border. They can't stop everybody. They can't stop all the drugs coming across. And it's flowing in. And when they, the two million people that are coming across, basically they have to release them. Is this an issue that you've been hearing about from your constituents, given the fact that you do have a high Latino population in the 8th Congressional District? It's a issue that I hear about from all of my constituents, yes. They're concerned about the border. They're greatly concerned about the fentanyl. You know, <clears throat> this last um, February is when there were five fentanyl overdoses, and they were in Commerce City, which is within this district. And it was the Denver police officer, the Denver police chief, I'm sorry, Chief Pazin, who came out and said that the legislature was complicit in leaving drug dealers on the street. So I went back and looked at the bill he was talking about that basically took and legalized, and I know it's not going to be straight up legalized, so somebody's going to criticize me on there, but in my mind it's essentially legalizing fentanyl when you take it from <clears throat> a misdemeanor, or take it from a felony and make it a misdemeanor, a slap on the wrist. So this legislature, former legislature, not me, but my opponent was part of it, and she voted for it. Took, it. took fentanyl, possession of fentanyl, up to four grams, and made it a misdemeanor. 
a slap on the wrist. And what law enforcement, when they, when they were running the bill, law enforcement told them, no, don't do it. It won't be good for us. It'll be bad for Colorado. It won't help us do our jobs. And what you're Two talking years, about three for, years later. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just, for clarification, <coughs> what you're talking about is that 2019 law that passed in the Colorado State yes. Legislature that was bipartisan. I didn't say it wasn't. In fact, when I went to the Senate floor, because um, I went and looked up the bill, my predecessor was a prime sponsor on the bill. And I went to the floor on the Senate floor in February, after the police chief said that, after five fentanyl overdoses in Commerce City, and said, hey, look, I don't like being called out by the police chief. I don't like being called out by law enforcement. You know, this problem was caused. I said right on the floor that my predecessor, I didn't say it was just Democrats, said my predecessor carried this bill. Look, we know there's a problem. The governor said there's an issue in, way back in December and said we need to take care of it. The attorney general said there was an issue. We needed to get possession down to zero, down to zero grams of fentanyl. Here we are February. We've done nothing. We've got a police chief who's calling us out. We've got law enforcement that's calling us out. We know how to fix this. Let's just get it fixed. It took till May, and they still didn't get it fixed. Law enforcement is still not happy with where, where it happened. <clears throat> so what we were told was by drug dealers. Who told us? They follow the laws. They, they know what's going on, more so probably than everyone else does. And so what it meant when they could carry around four grams, possess up to four grams, possession and distribution are one and the same. They could go out and sell 39 pills. And a half hour later, they could go back out and sell another 39 pills. That's what was going on. The law got changed where uh, it's up to one gram is still a misdemeanor. So all that means is instead of 39 pills, they're just going to carry around nine pills and we'll meet you in the park next to your house. And half hour later, if you need more, we'll just bring another nine pills. It didn't solve any issue. Law enforcement told us it wouldn't solve the issue. So far, it still hasn't solved the issue. Let's um, stick on the topic of, of the border, if that's all right, um, and kind of just talk about you know <coughs> some of the other kind of things that you want, just since we're on the topic of securing the border. Um, you know, one of the things you've talked about is um, immigration reform. We haven't seen immigration reform in decades. I think the last major immigration mm -hmm. reform is 1986. Um, why do you, do you have confidence that something can ha change um, that hasn't changed in decades, you know, with you as a member of Congress? And, and what would that, you know, potentially look like? I have confidence and I have hope. Um, and I'm not going to say, sit here and try and say that it's going to be easy. But I think immigration reform, first off, starts with securing the border. Again, having people come through the front door. But then we need to look at the dreamers. You know, it's DACA, but it's the dreamers. The, the children that were brought here, no fault of their own, didn't really even realize it until they got older and they were trying to go out and maybe go to college or get a job, and all of a sudden they realize they've got an issue. And then <clears throat> apparently there's something where like every two years they've got to do a bunch of paperwork. I think there's some things we should be able to clean up there. And I would be hopeful that regardless if you're a Republican or Democrat, that we could work to, make, to help with that issue. So let's work on the dreamers first. Then let's also, when I was down in El Paso, talking with um, a business community, the business community in El Paso County, in El Paso, Texas, sorry. Um, it's El Paso County here in Colorado, but in El Paso, Texas. They were talking about another way with regard to immigration reform or things that we should be looking at is how do we help build up the economy in places like Honduras and El Salvador and Mexico so that people don't feel like they need to come here for a job or try to fight their way here, that we help build up their economy. So I think that's a great idea as well. And then lastly, I think we need to look at our whole immigration process and our worker program. Um, you know, I've had dairy farmers, far other farmers who have said, look, we need to look at the H-2A program. Um, and we need also need to look at the, you know, the farm worker programs and we need to look at the H-2B programs and make sure that families feel like they can come with individuals, you know, when they're coming here. And there are things there that I think we could look at. So I have hope. Um, I have confidence because I haven't been there yet and nobody's said no yet. So um, I think we can work on it. I, I hope that it is something we can work on. It is something that we need to work on. Um, let's go ahead and switch topics again. Okay. Um, talk about election security. Obviously, it's a big topic that's come up over and over again over the past couple of years. So the first, uh, probably most obvious question is going to be um, do you? Um, trust in, in the results of the 2020 election and do you believe that Joe Biden is the legitimate president? So I've answered that question a few times <laughs> and yes I believe that Joe Biden is the legitimate president. Uh, 
some of your Republican, obviously the Republican is always described, the Republican Party is always described as a big tent party. Um, but you have some Republicans. So is the Democrat Party <laughs> considered the big tent party? <laughs> I've heard both. I've heard both. You tell me which okay. one. Okay. Um, but so tell me, you know, we do obviously have some Republicans that are still questioning the legitimacy of that um, and pushing for um, election reform, election integrity. I mean, where do you kind of fall in this conversation? How much do you think of it as noise and how much do you think we should be taking seriously kind of given what we saw play out, you know, on January 6th, for instance? I think what people are looking at is what occurred uh, in some other states, like in Pennsylvania and I think maybe Arizona or maybe even Georgia, where the Secretary of State and maybe even the state legislature, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm an expert on that one, I just don't know for sure, but it appeared that within those states they were changing the rules at last minute. And I think that leads to people not trusting the election system. I would say in this state, however, we've been doing mail-in ballots for over 10 years. And as a county commissioner, worked with the county clerk, made sure that things were funded. I understand about the encryption process, understand how the process works here in Colorado. It's not our Secretary of State who gets to decide how elections or runs the elections, it's the county clerks. And so, yeah, I have faith, that, you know, I know the county clerk in Weld County and Larimer County, um, somewhat in Adams County, and I think they do their job. So I think there are always going to be areas where we can improve, looking at voter ID, for example, making sure that we have election judges. Let's, let's be as transparent as we possibly can be uh, when it comes to the elections. People want to, want to make sure that they can trust the process, so let's do what we can to, to ensure that. Um, if, there, if anybody's got some other great ideas on how we can ensure that there's integrity, additional integrity in the process, I'm all ears. Let's hear them. Let's hear what they are. But at this point, the election process, as far as I understand it and what I know here in Colorado, Joe Biden is our legitimate president. So the next most obvious question is, would you accept the results, win or lose, of this midterm election? Yes. Yeah. I accepted the results of the primary. I accepted the results in 2020 when I ran for state senate. So yes. And then um, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the internal election security bill, Senate Bill 153, that passed this year. <coughs> it was one of those bills that you voted no on. Um, the aim of it, you know, from the Democrats that kind of put it up, was to add more transparency with things like more security and surveillance cameras and more monitoring. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your no vote? Sure. I was relying on um, my clerk and talking to clerks throughout the state um, and talking to their lobbyists. And I'm not sure that the bill was actually even really needed. Um, adding in additional security, I mean, it's there. I know as a county commissioner we pay for those things. I think there was basically that bill was kind of a, you know, kind of going after an attack, if you will, on uh, Tina Peters in Mesa County and trying to clean up what she did in her county. I don't think that's what happened throughout the state of Colorado. So um, I can't necessarily sit here and remember all the specifics on that bill, but I do know that we worked on it. We got a couple of amendments on it on the Senate floor uh, where I injected that the county commissioners needed to be more involved versus the Secretary of State in determining who the election officials are uh, because that's a role that county commissioners do have. And I think they were trying to divert that over to where the Secretary of State would have more authority and more power. And I think that would have led to uh, d more distrust by people in the state. So that's why I voted no. The County Clerks Association supported that bill. Um, mm -hmm. Eventually they, they did. Uh, and so, you know, when you have, you, I mean, one answer you're saying you would support, <coughs> you know, seeing more transparency, and the next answer you're saying that you didn't support this particular bill despite, you know, some of the transparency. Is that a contradiction? I don't believe so. Again, I talked to specific county 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 clerks and um, got their opinion on it and when I saw the bill it's different than possibly what it was when it came out of the house so no I don't think so again it looked to me like there was some where we were trying to move some power and authority over to the Secretary of State that I thought should be left with the county clerk and left in the county and let's go ahead and switch again about oil and gas, um, something okay. that you kind of started this interview talking about with all your experience. Um, so, you know, you've been a staunch supporter of the oil and gas industry. We've kind of seen um, Colorado moving to put more regulations on it. Um, and I kind of wanted to get your take, you know, as you know, a state senator, there's one role that you can play in the state kind of regulations. You know, as a U.S. congressperson, you'd be playing a different role. How do you see that role kind of transitioning? And, you know, what would that broader sort of nationwide approach kind of look like? So, so first of all, um, we didn't just kind of put more regulations on. Senate Bill 181, which was sponsored, prime sponsored by my opponent, 
really work to do a de facto moratorium or ban on oil and gas in the state of Colorado. And they did a really pretty good job at it. So it wasn't just we were going to kind of put on more regulations. More regulations that I would remind you that Governor Hickenlooper, now U.S. Senator Hickenlooper, said we had the most robust regulations in the nation, which means, quite frankly, we have the most robust regulations in the world because the United States is better at regulating um, the oil and gas industry, all energy industries, than any, any other place. So we're working very diligently here in this state and in this nation to ensure that we are bringing down the greenhouse gas issue, that we are addressing the ozone issue. And in my county specifically, I do know that over a 15-year period, a period of time where oil and gas activity increased, where close to 50% of the oil and gas activity, 40, actually more than that, but 50% of the oil and active oil and gas wells were in Weld County. 90% of the oil production, 43% of the gas production was in my county. So over this same 15-year period from 2006 to 2019, our population increased by 100,000. Yet our ozone levels at the monitoring, to monitoring towers went down by about 20% down to 65 parts per billion. Now that's not going to mean a lot to a lot of folks, but what they need to understand is the EPA standard for your health, so this is the United States Environmental Protection Agency, their standard to make sure that people can stay healthy was 70 parts per billion. And in Will County it was at 65 parts per billion. So I think some of those rules and additional was just piling on and again it was a way to ensure that we didn't have oil and gas development in this state. And when it comes to energy, I'm in all of the above. You will not, I don't think you'll be able to find, I haven't gone out and researched it totally to say absolutely, but I don't think you would be able to find a county commissioner who has approved more oil and gas, wind energy, or solar energy than me. So I'm an all of above, and I think when we look at it from a national level, we need to look at all of the above as well, but we need to be producing domestic energy. It needs to be here in the United States. We don't need to be going to China or Iran or anywhere else, Venezuela, to get our energy. We have an abundance of energy here in the United States, both oil and gas, both fossil fuel and renewable energy. And I would be supporting anything that brings domestic energy back to the United States and brings those good, solid paying jobs back to Colorado and back to the United States. Do you foresee a time or a way down the line where we could transition eventually to all clean energy in a fair and just way? Well, first of all, I just explained to you how the fossil fuel industry has really become a clean energy as well. And second of all, I think the transition to get to there, you, you need natural gas for electricity. You need natural gas for fertilizer. You need natural gas for a lot of things. You need fossil fuels for a lot of things that you're wearing, for example. Um, for those vehicles, those electric cars, you need oil and gas for those electric cars to be able to build them. So I think a transition working towards and, and developing um, rules, developing innovations and products that help us bring our emissions down, that get our you know, greenhouse gas under control, which we are doing here. Um, yeah, I think eventually there will be a transition. That's just the nature of things. I mean, think of how we've gone, even in our um, you know, energy development, to heating your, for heating your home. You know, it used to be things like grass and dung, and then it went to firewood, and then to coal, and now we're to clean, burning natural gas. That makes sense. So yes, do I think there's going to be transitions? Absolutely. You also brought up the EPA, and it's just downgraded the front range to a severe violator of greenhouse mm -hmm. and gas emissions. Yep. A quarter of those emissions come from oil and gas production and consumption. Um, so going back to, you know, making sure that we're not putting too much of a burden on families with inflation and, and now with something like this, because it will mean higher octane levels here in Colorado, which means higher gas prices for people. Um, if, are there things that you could do as a member of Congress to help out? So first of all, I'm not sure where your numbers come from to say that it's a quarter of the emissions are related to oil and gas. I'd have to go back and really look at that to make sure that's true. I do know with regards to the ozone issue here that basically anywhere from 60 to 65 percent is naturally reoccurring. So it's going to happen regardless if we're all here or if oil and gas development here is, is here or not. And that's from a study that the Colorado Department of Health has done. Um, as far as things that are being done, 
I think just even looking at what's occurred over the last 20 years through innovations in oil and gas development, in uh, looking at our automobiles and how can we upgrade those, we've done a great job in reducing emissions uh, throughout the state of Colorado. So are there things maybe in Congress? I'm sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm trying to remember. What was your question totally? Just there things you, can, you feel like you can do as a member of Congress. Um, I think we always need to look at what can we do, but we don't want to stifle innovation because it's that innovation that starts leading us to even lower greenhouse gas emissions, even lower ozone emissions. And so we want to make, make sure that we um, encourage innovations to do that. I mean, if you go back and look at even the automobile industry or the oil and gas industry over the last 20 years and the innovations, the things that they've done, I mean, catalytic converters. Think what that has done to help reduce emissions. And those are areas where we're going to have to keep continuing to work on. So in Congress, if there's areas that I can help work on that and, and um, proliferate innovation so that we keep reducing emissions, yes, we, we need to keep doing that. But I think also from a national point of view, we need to look at what the other countries around our world are doing. Europe and China shouldn't get let off. You know, it shouldn't be all on the backs of Americans that we are reducing our greenhouse gases, reducing our emissions. Do you know that, you know, you talked about going to severe. You know that basically 45% of the non-attainment area, it comes from, the non-attainment issue comes from outside of the non-attainment area. It's, you know, it's coming from other parts. And it comes across the ocean, believe it or not, from China. They're a huge part of that. So I think there needs to be deals worked out where China starts getting their emissions, their greenhouse gases, their ozone issues under control as well. Is that something that you feel confident that you could attack as a member of Congress or promote? I, I think it is something that, yeah, definitely I would promote and that I would work on and try and have a voice in. Sure. Um, I just have a few final ones that don't really fit into any category. But um, okay. so, you know, I'm curious, you know, if you were elected to this position, is there a politician, you know, either here in Colorado or <laughs> elsewise that you would try to kind of model yourself after? I mean, what kind of a politician, you know, are you going to be if the voters trust you to send you to Washington to represent them? Well, this person isn't living, <laughs> but I would say somebody like Ronald Reagan. I think he was a great communicator and he worked to reduce taxes, to get the budget under control. And he really worked to unify and bring people together. I think as a state senator, you know, I talked about my record as a county commissioner, but as a state senator, I have a good record of going across the aisle and working with people. Because, not just because we have to, because I'm in the minority, but because it's the right thing to do. There are some issues that I just don't think should be that partisan. When we're talking about education, it's everybody's kids, so we should all be able to come together and work on it. And then this last session, I was able to work with uh, a senator who's a Democrat, other side of the aisle, and we were able to increase education funding for special education. So again, I think Ronald Reagan had those kind of qualities. He was a great leader. He was a good listener. He was great at communicating with people, probably because of those where he would, was willing to listen to folks, and then really bring people together to move our country forward. That's what I would hope to emulate. Uh, with something like that, um, you know, it's always so interesting to me because Colorado is always, um, you know, we can feel partisan at times, but we're always described here, particularly at the state legislature, as being a very bipartisan process where the vast majority of the bills that get through have at least some bipartisan support. That's not the same case as what we hear in Washington, D.C., with all of the partisanship and the gridlock <coughs> and, and the descriptors that are constantly used there. Um, as a freshman lawmaker, you know, you, is there any concern that you would kind of fall into some of that partisanship, just given kind of how the, the seas have parted, I suppose? I think there's always going to be some partisanship because there are just some issues, like increasing taxes not balancing the budget, I mean, things of that nature that have a tendency to, you know, be more divisive than unifying. But I think there are other issues like transportation, like education, like even securing our border and immigration reform that we should be able to come together and figure out how to move our country forward. Even if it's just a small step at first, that's what it takes. And I think you have to work at it. You know, when I first became a state senator, again, in the minority, you know, it was 20 to 15, 20 Democrat senators, 15 um, Republican senators. And, you know, I asked some of the other legislators, other state senators, Republicans, and I even asked some of my friends who are lobbyists that worked down at the Capitol. I was like, 
who can I go talk to? Who can I start developing a relationship with? And like, who, who do you think I might have something in common with? And then you go start building those relationships. But I will tell you, when I won my primary this year, I had six Democrat legislators who all texted me and said, good job, we're proud of you. You know, good luck as you go forward. Six Democrats, that's pretty darn good. On election night, think to give, send me a text. So I hope that I'll be able to build those types of relationships. I think I've demonstrated that I can and that I will. And um, I hope to do that again as I get into Congress. I think it's important. We have to figure out how to move our country forward. Would you join the Freedom Caucus if you were to be elected in November? I, I don't believe so, but I'm, I'm not going to say no or yes, because I haven't really researched that. I mean, right now I am focusing on winning this race, making sure that I am listening to my constituents, listening to people, hearing what their concerns are, and focusing on that, saying this is where I want to really want to go work on. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and try and, you know, say, oh, I'm going to go join this or go join that. I've got to win first. So if I'm honored to be elected as their congresswoman from the first, first time in Congressional District 8, They've got my pledge. I'm going to go search out everything, research everything. I'm not just going to go jump into something. And um, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to be their voice and can be able to come back here and look them in the eye and say, yep, I worked on that. Yes, that's that was important to you. I made sure it was important to us. Um, your opponent, um, I checked the FEC filings this morning. She's outraised you significantly. Um, and yet, in the latest 538 poll, I saw that you have a slight advantage over her. Uh, I'm curious how you think money plays a role in, in this campaign. Or is there any concern that, that, you know, that much more spending could result in, in a loss for you? Um, there's always a concern when you're getting outspent. But I will say that I've had several races where I was outspent by a lot. <laughs> and uh, I still won. So I think it goes back to how hard are you willing to work for it? How well are you listening to your constituents? And being very efficient and effective with the resources that you do have. You know, in this race, I had a primary. I had a four-way primary. So I basically spent down to zero. So on July 1st, I had to start all over again kind of thing. My opponent didn't have to do that. So she had an advantage there. But I also think it helped me get my name ID out there. So do I think that resources play in it? Yeah, to some extent. But I think it's your message and who you are as a person plays into it more. And I don't think that I've ever had an opponent that outworks me in a, in a campaign. So I think I'm in the same position there. Because as I've stated, I spend a lot of time going and knocking and walking and talking to people at their door. And when they're willing to come outside their door and start talking to you, you know you have them. Because they're, they're engaged. And I bet I hit close to 10,000 doors in the primary. And I've been hitting doors all since June 28th again. And then let me just ask you about one final thing that I did skip over um, and before you got to go. Um, so let's talk a little bit about gun reforms just because of what we have seen kind of playing out here in Colorado um, with unfortunate mass shootings, um, police officer shootings. Um, I mean, what would you like to see done? Is there more to be done on a national level uh, to kind of address some of these issues? I think back in the late 2000s, well, the middle 2000s, 2005 and through that period, we had Homeland Security, and they put a lot of money into critical infrastructure and fortifying and hardening public facilities, public places. You know the one area we didn't do anything on? Schools. We didn't fortify, we didn't harden our school facilities. And maybe that's going to sound a little harsh to people, but I don't think so at this point. And so I think as Congress that we can look at how do we provide funds to really go in and look at fortifying and, and, and you know, it's a critical infrastructure. It's where our kids are at. It, it amazes me every time I walk into the Capitol and I see the security that you have to go through and those, you know, those concrete blocks that are outside that people think that they're supposed to sit down on. Those are balusters. Those are critical infrastructure protection. We don't do any of that in our schools. Or maybe we're starting now. But I think that's an area where we need, really need to work on and fortify our schools, harden those facilities, and protect our kids. People shouldn't be able to get in or get out People are going to go do, you know, bad guys are going to go do bad things. Shouldn't be able to just walk into our schools. Are there any other, because we did have some gun legislation um, reforms kind of go through Congress this year, was there anything specifically related to the actual firearm that you think needs to be done or looked at? I know um, 
Colorado's kind of done its own things, and, mm -hmm. and you've had different stances on those. But when it comes to actual firearms on a federal level? No, not at this point. Um, is there any topic that you think that I missed? No. Okay. I don't think so. I want to respect your time because I know you got to get out of here. So okay. um, we'll end it there. All right. Barb Kirkmeyer, thank you so much for joining us. She is a congressional candidate for con uh, Congressional District 8, which is Colorado's newest congressional district. Yes. Thank you so much. Appreciate having the opportunity to speak with your viewers.